Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science. Uh, fantastic to be back. Those of you who were here last month might have seen that I was briefly absent. I was traipsing around the country doing some great filming for Food Lab with Ben Milbourne. You might have seen um, us here do a talk in Briz Science um, recently. So we were doing some more filming for the third season of that, which was very good fun. But I'm back now and ready for some more science here. So if this is your first time tonight, welcome. This is Briz Science, Brisbane's series of free monthly lectures on science brought to you by the University of Queensland, where we bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research and passions with you. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. I also recognise those whose ongoing efforts to promote and protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture will leave a lasting legacy for elders in the future. Tonight, um, we are, of course, presented by the University of Queensland, who have supported Briz Science for 11 years now. And we are here at the wonderful The Edge part of the State Library of Queensland, which is our wonderful venue partner. So um, check out all the great things that they have on their website. There's some wonderful workshops going on. The makerspace downstairs is fantastic. Tonight, we are, of course, we have a wonderful speaker who I'll introduce in a moment. And then we will have the opportunity for you to ask questions. You can do this via the question slips you would have received on your way in. You write your question down there or on anything. But we also take questions on Twitter, hashtag BrizScience. So if you have your phone, you can now set it to silent, boot up Twitter, and get ready for some live tweeting throughout the night. After that, the usual drill is, of course, food and drink outside, chance to chat to your fellow attendees and also to our guest scientist and explore any other ideas you have. Now, I have heard a rumour that some very enthusiastic audience uh, from British Science are really getting into the food. And while I support that, maybe bringing Tupperware... Look, right, you've got, you've got to pay that. Um, so, very enthusiastic. Um, however, we might just ask, you know, let, let sort of have everyone have one run through first. And we have asked the caterers to poison one sandwich tonight, which will be removed after the end of the questions. So, uh, you know, just, yeah, chill out for a minute. It'll be great. Um, but other than that, we really encourage you to hang around, enjoy some food, have a drink, and um, savour the moment. <laughs> Okay, on that note, it's my great pleasure tonight to be introducing Dr. Lavinia Codd, who started off her career as an accountant, working in Brisbane, London and more, but then made a career change into science. Came back from the dark side, it's always great. And eventually gained a very personal interest in researching the brain, neuroplasticity, and how to translate laboratory findings into new strategies for stroke survivors. So, to share more of her research and her story tonight, could you please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Lavinia Codd. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight and I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation to speak to you about the research that we're doing. Uh, I'll be talking, uh, you know, about the story about the hippocampus, a part of the brain that I'm really passionate about. Uh, I'll tell you a bit, little bit about my story and I'll be talking about how memories are formed. Um, so, it seems a bit trite to say it, but we all know that the brain is the most important organ in the, in the, in the human body or in any body. It's how we, uh, every thought we have comes from the brain, every emotion. Uh, it's how we process our sensations. It's how we attend to things and how we make decisions and then act on those decisions. So it's, it's all happening in the brain. So it is the most important organ in the body. But how do we study the brain? Because let's face it, it's inside our skulls. We can't see it from the outside. It's hard to look at. Well, we can look at the outside of the brain. You know, after somebody's passed on, we can have a look at their brain. And, you know, we can look at the outside of the brain. And I guess it's got all these wiggly bumps. And, you know, there's not much you can really say about apart from that. It's not the prettiest of organs, but it is the most important. Interestingly, you know, the human humans have some of the largest brains on the planet. 
And these, these bumps and, and, and wiggles that we have on the brain are fairly similar between people. They're not exactly the same, but they are fairly similar. So there is a structure to the brain, even though it might not look like there's a structure. There is generally a structure to the brain. And if we look in the inside of the brain, we can see that this structure becomes even more refined. You know, we have um, the, the cortex on the outside, which is the winky, uh, wonky bit. And then we have see, this structure here. Uh, is actually the corpus callosum, which uh, joins the two hemispheres. So that's where, that's where all the white matter tracks are passing through the brain so that we can have coordination between the two different hemispheres. And we can see the brain stem and the cerebellum. I mean, there are lots of different structures in the brain, so surely they do different things. But how do we know what the different parts of the brain do? And a lot of that information, um, oh, actually I should say, you know, from all of these structural analyses, we can build up a picture of the brain and we can, actually we can give them all names, you know, but it still doesn't tell us what they do. And a lot of that information really comes um, from neurological patients. Some of the initial research that we do actually comes, or the initial uh, pathways to knowledge that we have with what the different brain structures do comes from some fairly famous um, neurological patients. And so I'll be talking today mainly about this structure here called the hippocampus um, because it's a, it's a very important part of the brain, especially in the formation of memories. Uh, and it's not until you lose part of your brain that you just realise how important uh, these different structures are. So I'm going to talk about my stroke tonight and so first I'll define stroke and I, probably a lot of you know what a stroke is. Basically it's a disruption in the supply of blood to part of the brain. So there's lots of arteries feeding lots of different parts of the brain and if one of those arteries becomes um, blocked, as is in the most common form of stroke in Australia, this is an example of what happens there, and that blockage can happen uh, when there's uh, a build-up of plaques inside the artery itself or a clot might form elsewhere in the body, say in the heart, travel through the circulatory system and end up lodged in the brain. Um, or you can have a burst aneurysm, uh, which is where there's a thinning in the lining of the, what, the walls of one of the blood vessels in the brain and it might burst. But the most common form we have in Australia are ischemic strokes from a, from a clot or a blockage in an artery. And what happens then is if the blood can't get through, the part of the brain that was originally supplied by that artery is now starved of blood. So it's not rece receiving any oxygen or any nutrients. And so those cells die. And basically that's what a stroke is, a death of part of your brain. And so uh, I promised I'd talk about my own stroke and so I'm actually going to show uh, you pictures of my own brain. So I actually hate these images. I've seen it, them quite a lot of times and they disturb me every single time. You can never get used to seeing a hole in your own brain. And in case you can't see my stroke, I'm going to put a little red um, square uh, outside them. These are three different sections uh, or images taken from MRIs of my brain, um, either you know, axial or horizontal, sagittal, so that's side on, or coronal, which is going through this way. And I guess the biggest hole that you can see would be here, this one here. That looks like the biggest hole in my brain. Now, this little triangle black hole over there is meant to be there. That's a ventricle. It's one of the fluid-filled sacs in the brain that we need um, to have the cerebrospinal fluid in. But this big hole here is actually a hole, effectively. It's where my brain has died and those cells have been phagocytized, they've been eaten up by other support cells and there are no longer neurons there. So I've lost that brain part of my brain. This is another uh, ver version of that. You can see that there's a hole there. And so these two holes are quite distinct and look quite bad. But interestingly, they haven't had the most impact on, on my life going forward. The biggest impact on my life going forward since the stroke has actually pr been from this tiny little hole here because that's the hippocampus. Now, if you look here, the hippocampus is that tiny little almond shape there. So it doesn't look very impressive, but it's actually very, very, very important. And so I've still got some hippocampus probably on the left here, but not very much. And what's left is probably actually quite scarred, so perhaps it's non-functional. So all of those things combined have led to the deficits that I've experienced following my stroke. So the cortical parts of my brain that have been damaged here and here, uh, the main cortical uh, part of that was damaged for me was the occipital lobe. So that's because my stroke happened in the posterior cerebral artery and that, that runs along the, back, the bottom and the back of the brain. 
So the posterior cerebral artery actually supplies several parts of the brain. It supplies the occipital lobe, some of the temporal lobe, and then the hip part of the hippocampus. And in terms of what cortical damage I've re received, I've now lost my left field of vision because it was the medial temporal lobe that was damaged. So this is actually the right side of my brain because uh, it's, the image is flipped. So I've lost my left field of vision. So if I look at this part of the audience, this part of the audience, I can't see it. I know it's there, but I can't actually see it. Much in the same way, you know, people say, well, what does it look like? Is it, is it black? It's just not there. It's the same as behind you isn't. You can't see it, but you know it's there. So it's just not there for me. I, can't, I do have some little tiny pockets of vision, but I, my brain tends to blank them out because they're really just a distractor. So for me, I've lost my left field of vision. My right field of vision is fine and my central vision is fine, as apart from the glasses, but I don't have left field of vision. So left field of vision, to be honest, isn't that important. I mean, I walk into things when I'm at home because I'm relaxed and I'm not attending to my environment, but really, it's not that important. I wasn't allowed to drive for a year, but after a year, they did all the tests and they said, OK, no, we're, we're happy to give you your licence back. So when I drive, I pay uh, a lot of attention and I scan the road. I'm quite present when I'm driving. So in the long run, it actually hasn't had a huge impact on my life. Left field, it's annoying missing left field and I'd love it back, but it's not actually having a big impact on my life. The bigger impact on my life has come from the hippocampal damage and the overlying um, temporal lobe that I've, that I've lost because the hippocampus and the, and the temporal lobe that's just uh, lying over that um, structure is actually really important for forming new memories and for spatial navigation. We need functioning hippocampi to be able to form new memories and we need that in conjunction with the temporal lobe to be able to navigate through space. So, Memory is a much, much, much more relevant part of our lives than left field of vision. So when I had my stroke, you know, there are lots of signs of stroke. People will often tend to think about the FAST acronym, so facial droop, arm paralysis, that's the F and the A, S stands for speech, uh, that, and then it's time to go to the hospital. So that's the FAST acronym, and that covers quite a few of the more commonly observed um, deficits following stroke. But that tends to arise when you have a blockage in a di different artery to me. So that's the middle cerebral artery that wraps around the side of the brain. And that does lead to problems with speech and communication and problems with motor function. And for me, that would have a much bigger impact, impact on my life than left field of vision. So I think in terms of damage and deficits following stroke, I got off lightly in terms of the left field of vision. But what I didn't get on, off on lightly was the confusion um, that surrounds the initial loss of the hippocampus because I went from having two functioning hippocampi because you've got one in each hemisphere to just having one overnight, just like that. So it's kind of like an immediate onset dementia. Obviously, I've recovered quite a lot since then. But basically, you know, so the, 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 you know, the more commonly known uh, deficits are facial paralysis, speech and, and um, muscle weakness. But there are others. Difficulty swallowing and balance are two other signs that you could be having a stroke. So I think the thing that I wanted you to take home from this particular slide was that any sudden onset um, disruption to how you're able to function really could be a sign of um, that you're having a stroke. And I would urge you to go to the hospital because time is brain. And the faster you get to the hospital, you, the more likely you are to receive the correct medical treatment. So people don't realise just how common stroke is. Uh, you know, we have over 50,000 strokes in Australia every year. And that's about one in ten, one Australian every 10 minutes, or I think it's actually now one in Australian every nine minutes. And we actually, you know, a th a quite a lot of people do survive strokes, such as myself. So the numbers build up over time. So we actually have over 470,000 stroke survivors living in Australia right now. So these are people who've survived their strokes. They might have had multiple strokes, but they're, they're all stroke survivors and they've, they've, they're all living in Australia at this point in time. Interestingly, although age is one of the major risk factors for stroke, a third of those stroke survivors are actually the, under the age of 65. So young people have strokes as well, as I'm a pretty good example of. I was 31 when I had my stroke. Um, that was just over 17 years ago. So it's, it's 
not as common in young people, but when we have a stroke when we're younger, obviously we're surviving for quite some time. So that adds to that figure of a third of every stroke survivor in Australia being under the age of 65. So what do you do with somebody who's got damage like mine that isn't going to need treatment from a physiotherapist, isn't going to need treatment from a speech therapist? None of those therapies are ever actually going to help me because those aren't my deficits. You can't really do anything for the lost vision, but what about the memory problems? I was lucky enough to receive some really good advice from uh, a wonderful neuropsychologist, um, Andy McAllister, who was up at RBWH. That's not where I had my stroke, I'm not saying that. Um, but he, I did go and seek his advice uh, afterwards. My neurologist sent me along to him. And his, he, he looked at me and he said, look, Lavinia, I'm just not sure, he tested me and he said, I'm just not sure what I can offer you. I really think the best thing for you to do to recover, to get better, because primarily what I wanted was my old life back. I was really happy doing the science degree that I'd started when I'd first had kids and I'd given up work to uh, left the accounting field. I really wanted that life back. And he said, well, take it back. The best thing you can do for your brain is to go back to university and keep going with your studies. Uh, because I'll be challenging the very parts of my brain that have been damaged as part of the stroke. I'll be having to form new memories. I'll be having to learn. I'll be have to, having to navigate and learn new faces. So it was, it was really the easiest way for me to get better was to come back to university. The other thing it, it was, you know, it wasn't a job. So if I, if I made a mistake, I was just going to get a bad mark in an exam. I wouldn't impact on a business that I was trying to help. So... In the end, that's what I decided to do. I went back to the University of Queensland and I kept going with my science degree. Initially, I just did one subject a semester, which for anyone who knows, a normal load is about four or five subjects. So it's actually, that's pretty low. But I did have an 11-month-old child and a two and three-quarter-old child. So I had two little kids and a stroke and a memory deficit. So um, I think it was fair that I went back one subject for a semester for a while. And eventually I did go back to two subjects a semester. But basically, um, you know, I stay, stayed there and I did my study. And as part of the undergrad science degree, I did quite a few uh, psychology subjects. And one of the patients that you often learn about in uh, undergrad psychology or science subjects is patient HM. He's one of the most famous uh, patients that we have in terms of understanding the role of the hippocampus in forming new memories. So um, he was born in 1926 and he actually had intractable epilepsy to the point where he was fitting um, several times a day uh, and they actually thought it was going to end up taking his life. So in 1926, um, neurosurgeon Wil William Schofield actually removed the damaged part of his brain, that w which is where the, the epilepsy was arising from which happened to be his hippocampus. Now, he didn't just take one hemisphere of the hippocampus, he actually took both sides of the hippocampus. And you can see that here, these holes here, are where the, um, HM's, uh, or Henry Mollison's, we always call him patient HM, where though that he's removed his um, hippocampi. So the interesting thing, was that uh, he was on, went on to be studied by uh, Brenda Milner, was one of the most famous people researching him, because from that point on, he could never form a new declarative memory. So he could learn procedural memories, like riding a bike, uh, and in his case, it was mirror drawing. He had to mir uh, draw uh, something uh, that he was looking at in a mirror uh, and, and reverse it. So he could learn new sort of um, techniques and, and new uh, motor function memories. He could form new mo motor function memories, but he could never form new declarative memories. So if you met him on one day, he wouldn't remember you the next day. If he read the same book, he could read it over and over and over, and he would never know what had happened in the book. He could never retain memories uh, more than a very short period of time. So basically from that, we got the idea that, hey, the hippocampus is actually really form, uh, important for forming new memories. Now, interestingly, it's not where memories are stored because memories are stored all the way through your brain because all of his old memories from prior to the surgery were intact. So he could remember his schooling, he could remember the house that he grew up in, he could remember his parents. Uh, it was just the formation of new memories that he was now incapable of. And so this is the part of the brain, the hippocampus, as I said. Um, you know, so we know, we know a bit more about the hippocampus since then. 
But in terms of how it relates to stroke, well, my stroke was actually relatively rare. Direct uh, lesions of the hippocampus are not that common. They do, they do occur, but it's not as common as the other forms of stroke that you recognise where somebody has the, the paralysis and the speech problems. So why would I be interested in, in it with stroke? Well, cognitive de deficits are common following stroke, and learning and memory is a part of cognition. And actually, when they asked, um, uh, they, they conducted a survey of uh, stroke survivors, their carers, and a lot of clinicians to find out what were the major concerns for people following stroke. And actually, the top concern was the best ways to improve understanding and cognition following stroke. So most people who have a stroke will end up with some cognitive deficits, and they may appear gradually over time. Part of this is because of the sensitivity of the hippocampus. So even though you might not have a stroke directly in the hippocampus, that might not be the artery that's blocked off. If you have a stroke in anywhere else in the right hemisphere, your right hippocampus tends to be smaller than the left hippocampus, or tends to be smaller than control. So control, this is the right hemisphere, the side of, size of the hippocampus in a control, so this is per somebody who hasn't had a stroke. And if you look, at um, uh, somebody who has a right hemispheric stroke, so this is not including the hippocampus, just anywhere in the right hemisphere, that right hippocampus is now small, significantly smaller than the right hippocampus of a control. And the same if somebody has a left hemisphere hippocampus, that hippocampus is now significantly smaller than that of controls. So even though the hippocampus might not be directly involved in the stroke in itself, it does tend to atrophy, atrophy over time and shrink. And that has an impact on somebody's ability to form new memories. Now, that was in people, young, relatively young people, mean age of 40, and their first ever non-hippocampal stroke. But they have also looked at middle-aged people and elderly people who have had strokes, and they see similar trends, that there'll be an atrophy of the side in the hemisphere that you have the, uh, the stroke. And this is associated with cognitive decline. So, um, what, what, you know, why the hippocampus, and how did I end up working at QBI? So basically, I came back to university and I found out about HM and I was learning all about um, neuroscience and I was thinking, well, this is really what I want to study and where will I study it? And about that time, they were building uh, the Queensland Brain Institute. So at that stage, we were housed in a different building out at UQ and they were in the process of building this building. And so I decided, right, well, it's the Queensland Brain Institute. All they are interested in is understanding the brain. That's where I want to go. Because even though I was improving gradually over time, I wanted to recover fully, and I also wanted to help other stroke survivors. So I went to QBI, and that's where I met Professor Perry Bartlett, and he was the director at the time. Uh, I, didn't, I emailed him first, and I didn't tell him uh, what was wrong with me. I just said I was a student, I was getting good marks, and could I come to talk to him about potentially um, being a student, him taking me on as a supervisor. When I met him, I did, in fact, tell him what was wrong with me. I did disclose that I had a brain injury and that I had a learning and memory deficit. And to his credit, he not only took me in as a student to QBI, he took me on as his own personal student. So I was in Perry's lab for two undergrad subjects and then honours, and then I did a PhD with him. And uh, although we have a lot of disagreements, we have a fairly um, both headstrong people, uh, I, I, and I did take a very long time to do my PhD. My PhD took me seven years. I wouldn't really have gotten through with it, uh, through, gotten through the whole thing if it hadn't been for his mentorship. So I was lucky and I did get through. And basically we went on to, we were, we were investigating hippocampal neurogenesis. Now everyone knows about neuroplasticity. It's a term that we hear a lot. But what does neuroplasticity mean? And the thing, interesting thing is that people don't know is that there's lots of different forms of neuroplasticity. So rewiring of the brain is what we tend to think about it. And that might be making new connections from distinct different parts of the brain. Or it might be making connections, a lot more connections between neurons or brain cells that are really close together. And that's called synaptic plasticity. But a form of neuroplasticity that I'm interested in and that uh, Professor Perry Bartlett was interested in is neurogenesis. And that's the production of entirely new brain cells. So brain cells that didn't exist uh, when you were born. So the brain is such a complex organ uh, and so difficult to understand that for many, many, many years, we actually thought that the brain you were born with is pretty much what you died with until it, and, unless you had some sort of damage. 
we didn't really believe that you could, were in fact capable of producing new brain cells. So if you were killing off brain cells, that those brain cells would not be repopulated. And it was in 1965 that Altman and Das did the first study that actually found that in, uh, in young rats, in, in a rodent model, that new brain cells were actually being produced in the hippocampus. And they used um, a thymidine analogue, uh, which basically every time a cell divides, it needs new thymidine to replicate the DNA. So it takes up DNA. And what they did, uh, takes up the thymidine as one of the, one of the base pairs that helps make up um, DNA. So they labelled it with, uh, with H3, and basically every time a cell divided, it would take up some of that label, and you'd be able to tell that it was newly proliferated because the proliferation of a cell requires the reproduction or replication of the DNA in its entirety. So basically, this is, this is a close-up of the hippocampus, and I'll show a bit more of that in a minute. But this densely packed structure of cells, all these little um, grey splodges are, in fact, um, cells, but it's the black ones that we're interested in. So that cell there is a newly born cell, and that cell is a new, newly born cell, and so is that, whereas these cells were existing before. So this was the first indication that DNA replication was going on and that new cells were being porn, born in certain parts of the brain. And it is limited. It's not happening all over the brain. There's really only two main areas where new cells are being produced. And I'll show you them in a minute. But, in, uh, but nobody really took this on board. Nobody really believed that they were new, the cap brain was capable of producing new cells. And it wasn't until 1992 that Professor Bartlett, uh, his laboratory, in, in, a, in the same year another laboratory in another part of the world, made the same discovery that, in fact, the brain was capable of producing new neurons, new brain cells. And it's important to, to distinguish between just new brain cells and new neurons because there are lots of different cell types in the brain and the neurons are the ones that we think with effectively. And then there's a whole lot of different support cells. There's astrocytes and there's oligodendrocytes. But what we really want to see if we're thinking in terms of repair and neuroplasticity is more neurons. So this study was important because they actually cultured, they took some of the stem cells from the part of the brain where new neurogenesis was happening in the, in the hippocampus, and they cultured them in vitro, so in a petri dish. They also labelled them with um, a thymidine analogue, and so those, those cells are shown here, and so when they're positive for thymidine, they're showing up there, 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 and there. But what they also did was they stained for a neurofilament marker, which was only found in neurons. So this marker was not found in the other support cell types. It was only found in neurons. So it was important that these cells were positive for both the, the thymidine analogue as well as the, um, the, the new neuron filament marker, because that indicated that, that not only were cells proliferating in the hippocampus, but they were actually turning into neurons, which was a really significant step. And quite a groundbreaking step and a, a big, caused a big paradigm shift in uh, the field because we now know that there are, in fact, new neurons being produced all the way throughout our lives. We know this, uh, we, you know, we've modelled it, and there are, in fact, this is, this is a cartoon to show you basically where this neurogenesis is happening in the brain. So as I said, it's not happening all over the brain in an adult brain, but it is happening in some parts of the brain. And the two main parts are the lateral ventricles or the subgranular zones, subventricular zone of the lateral ventricles, so the, the area lining um, those whole, normal fluid-filled holes in the brain that, where the cerebrospinal fluid lies. There are some still stem cells there that divide and proliferate and produce new cells that migrate via this rostral migratory stream to form new interneurons of the olfactory bulb, so that's involved in the sense of smell. And the other a part of the brain uh, where we have new neurons being produced is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is interesting because it's not only sensitive to damage, uh, you know, in terms of stroke or any other form of hypoxia, it's also, sens it's also important in learning and memory, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's also the site of ongoing neurogenesis. So new neurons are produced throughout life in the hippocampus, but why are they being produced? What, what, for, what function do they have in the formation of memories, if anything? We know that memories aren't st stored in the hippocampus, so you know, it's a good thing, it, you know, it's a logical thing to think that the production of new neurons, the turnover of neurogenesis, is required for forming new memories. And so oh, I just wanted to show you, this is another form of staining of, this is another, this is a mouse brain, and we can see these are the different parts. So when we draw the hippocampus like this, it's for a reason. Because basically all the tiny little dots there are cells, but they're quite sparsely spread out. 
And we end up with this, um, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus and the CA regions of the hippocampus where we have these really densely packed areas uh, of cells. They're really, really tightly packed so that they're quite hard to distinguish from one another. And it's, and it's in the, the stem cells aren't living everywhere in the hippocampus or precursor cells. They're not living everywhere. They're living in the subgranular zone of the dentate gyrus. So that's where they're living. And an example of neurogenesis, uh, this is an example of neurogenesis. So this is a different form of fluorescent staining that I'm using now. And so the, the, the DAPI marks all, all cell nuclei. So basically all the cells in that densely packed uh, dentate gyrus are showing up here. But it's these bright yellow ones that are immature neurons. I've, I've stained this section for double cordon, which, which is a, 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 it's first expressed in cells that have made the initial commitment to a neuronal lineage. So these cells will become neurons, but they're baby neurons. They've li really just been born. Interestingly, though, these are the important ones in, for in terms of forming new memories. And you can see they're quite tightly packed along, along the subgranular zone of the dentate gyrus, and you can see the processes coming out of these new neurons, and they're making lots of connections with other parts of the brain. And so another way that we can look at neurogenesis is to look at proliferation. And so before I mentioned, mentioned um, the thymidine analogues, well, this is an animal that I've injected with BRDU or bromodeoxyuridine, which is another thymidine analogue that we can detect with fluorescence. And those cells are green. So if a cell is divided after I've injected this animal with um, BRDU, it's going to show up as green. So that's an indication that the cells are proliferating. But as I said, we, what we want to see is new neurons. And so I've stained for double cortin, which is another marker for new neurons. And so they're showing up here um, as red. And so you can see that uh, the, the uh, center of the neuron is yellow, uh, green, because uh, you know, it's proliferated. And then we have the um, outer surface of it is uh, positive for double cordon. So it's a migrating neuron and a newborn neuron. Now, these um, neurogenesis, as I said, is a form of neuroplasticity, and it's a really exciting form of neuroplasticity because neurogenesis is required for the formation of new memories. So if I take an animal that's been genetic genetically modified so that I can selectively ablate or kill off just those new neurons, so leaving the rest of the brain entirely intact, just take away those new neurons, that animal then has an inability to form uh, a, a spatial memory task. It actually has trouble forming new spatial memories. So all those mature neurons that are lining the dentate gyrus, all those blue ones, are still there, they're still intact, all the other circuitry is still intact, but those new neurons are taken out of that system. And that causes the animal not to be able to form these new spatial memories. And they end up with a bit of a learning deficit. Now, after that um, genetic ablation, the animals recover over time and they regain gain their ability to perform those um, behavioural tasks. So we know from that research that new neurons are required for the formation of the new memories. And the interesting thing is that this process, it's quite an involved process and it goes on for quite a long time. But that new neuronal production that we have throughout life isn't static and it does change with a lot of things. So this is just a cartoon of that process, and I've just got, uh, this is a still form now. We can see that the um, proliferating my neurons, uh, proliferating precursor cells are in the subgranular zone, and then gradually as they, they, um, they display the neuronal tendencies and they, they are positive for double cortin, they start moving up into the granule cell layer where they form new connections with pre-existing networks. And this is a just ca a cartoon of that process. But as we know, we've uh, over the last um, couple of decades, we've realised that this process does change with several things. And so I guess what I was interested in is could we change it following a stroke? So there's lots of things that impact on the rate of neurogenesis. So neurogenesis um, declines with ageing. It also declines in people with depression uh, and with stress. But there are positive regulators of neurogenesis. So there are certain growth factors that stimulate neurogenesis. Um, some antidepressants have been found to work through this pathway, although they have um, multiple pathways that they're working through. But interestingly, one of the most potent stimulators of neurogenesis that have been identified to date is voluntary exercise. So for the people in the audience who like exercising, that's fantastic, you're doing the right thing. Uh, for those of us who don't like it, it's an unfortunate discovery, but in fact, neurogenic, yeah, it, it's, it's a terrible thing because I hate running and people always ask me if I exercise now. Uh, and I'll prove to you in a minute that I do. <laughs> um, 
But basically, exercise being one of the most potent stimulators of neurogenesis, and it's also uh, something that's easy to test in animals, especially mouse models of stroke, because animals like to run. So really, to, to, in terms of voluntary exercise, all we have to do is put a running wheel in the cage with the animals, and they will automatically run. So um, for those of you who are curious about the ageing factor, and I know my parents are sitting just over there, so I'm sure they'd like to know about this. But we do know that you know, neurogenesis declines with ageing. So this is, an, uh, this is a mouse brain. And uh, sorry, I've, this is uh, work from Dr. Daniel Blackmore. Uh, he stained his uh, double cortin positive cells green. Um, so they're showing up green now. But these immature neurons, you can see in a 10-week-old animal, which is an adult, it's considered an adult, an adult in, mouse year, in mouse weeks, in mouse age. There's lots and lots of these uh, immature neurons lining the dentate gyrus, and you can see them close up here. Fast forward 12 months, and that's about middle age uh, in humans, and you can see there's a lot fewer of these double cortin positive cells. Fast forward to 24 months, which is nearing the end of the natural lifespan of a mouse that's um, kept in a laboratory, and really there's very few of these new neurons being produced. Having said that, we can stimulate the production of these new neurons. Even in aged animals, certain forms of exercise and certain uh, levels of exercise actually do stimulate the production of these new neurons. So you can actually, you know, the, the precursor cells are still existing in the, in the very aged brain and they can, can still actually be activated uh, by an external stimuli such as exercise. So, you know, it's interesting when I talk about the precursor cells or the stem cells that are living in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, when you get to a certain point, you know, they're actually fairly quiescent, they're, they're static, they don't actually, they don't proliferate all the time. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we're activating these cells. So we're taking them from a quiescent stage where they're just sitting there not really producing new neurons to an active state where they are producing new neurons. So in an aged animal, Daniel, Daniel Blackmore's work has found that if you stimulate the production of new neurons, in a, even in a very old animal that was showing a learning deficit in this, in this uh, behavioural paradigm that we use, they actually did improve in their ability to form new memories and perform this learning task. So even in very old animals, this ability to stimulate neurogenesis still had an impact on the learning and memory of those mice. So, of course, you know, Dan and Perry were interested in, in the aged brain. We have people who are interested in what happens in the depressed brain. I'm always thinking about myself and really only interested in what happens in the stroke brain. So, I wanted to know if we could improve recovery in cognitive functions following stroke. And the question we were asking was, could these hippocampal pre precursors be activated? And if we did activate them, did this lead to more neurogenesis? And if we did see neuro more neurons being produced, did this have any impact in the damaged hippocampus uh, on, the, uh, on the animal's ability to form new memories? And I'm pleased to say that it does. So this is an animal, this is the, you know, the dentate gyrus you're used to seeing by now that's in an animal that's had a stroke. So... This, uh, it's quite difficult to show something that's absent. So in terms of the lesion, this is where it is. So this, this, this trail of um, blue cells should continue all the way over to this line here. But you can see there's a gap here where the cells have died. So this animal has had a stroke in its hippocampus. So those cells are gone. And there's also a lot fewer of those immature neurons that we're used to seeing. So a lot of that process of neurogenesis has also been impacted by the stroke. And when I test these animals using the behavioural paradigms that we have at QBI, they have difficulty forming new memories. So I test them before and after stroke, and before the stroke, they were fine. After the stroke, they are unable to form these new spatial memories. If I compare that to an animal that has also had a stroke but yet been able to run, that's all they've done, that's the only treatment they've had, is having a free access to a running wheel. You can see that the, the lesion is still there, so the cell death has still occurred, but there's a lot more of these immature neurons uh, shown in red here that are being produced. So this gave me hope that in fact, even following stroke, that the brain is still plastic and we could see a stimulation or an, an activation of these stem cells and we could see new neurons being produced. But did this impact on behaviour? And I'm really pleased to say that it did. So we did see an improvement in these animals' ability to form new memories. Now, I'll be the last person to stand here and say that we've cured stroke and we've cured cognitive um, deficits following stroke because that's not what we've done. I've used a very discreet uh, lesion technique where I'm just 
damaging part of the hippocampus. There's no other damage to the brain. It's just a tiny part of the hippocampus that's being damaged. Um, so, you know, that was primarily so there were no other confounds, confounds that would impact on the ability to test these animals' learning and memory. But it's a very distinct sort of stroke. It doesn't represent all the sorts of strokes that we have. So when somebody has damage to arts of other parts of their brain, you've got to look at the whole brain, not just the hippocampus. So I've looked at this one part of the brain, but I've done it very carefully. The thing that I take back from this, and that I would like everyone to understand, is that the brain is a plastic organ. And even in areas of damage, where we have damage, we have lost cells from, say, stroke, or from other neurological conditions, say, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, or traumatic brain injury, and even in just the aged brain, it's still an incredibly plastic organ. And something as simple as voluntary exercise can impact on the number of new cells being produced in your brain. And I think that alone is an amazing thing to take away. So no, I haven't cured stroke, but this gives me hope that the brain is quite plastic and that we're on a really good track of trying to understand this process. Because of course, following stroke and in aged people, not everyone can exercise. So what another part of the area that we're researching quite heavily at QBI and Perry's lab is the underlying molecular changes that are resulting in the stimulation or activation of these stem cells. Because if we can find out the molecules that are involved, perhaps we can bypass exercise and come up with a pharma pharmacotherapy, so a drug treatment instead, um, which could be used by people who are in wheelchairs or who are paralysed. Um, so that's, you know, one of the interesting studies that is going on at QBI at the moment. We have a very large exercise trial in aged humans where they're doing just that. They're looking at different forms of exercise and different levels of exercise because too much exercise is actually not necessarily a good thing. So we do see um, a plateau effect. In fact, we do see a decline. So too much exercise can also be a bad thing. So really what we want to find is the sweet spot of the right amount of exercise. So we've done a lot of work in, oh, Daniel Blackmore's done a lot of work in, in the animal models, and now we're translating that into, uh, into, the, into the clinics in terms of aged humans. So they're doing um, scans of the brain to look for structural changes, to look for changes in the con connectivity between different parts of the brain. They're looking at cognitive performance, and they're looking at blood-borne factors to determine if we can isolate the particular molecules that are involved in this activation of the stem cells. So at this point, usually somebody, you know, any time I've ever given a talk on neurogenesis following stroke, somebody always asks me if I exercise, and I'm really glad to say that this is me doing the bridge to Brisbane with my lovely sister and my daughter and my nephew. So I do do some exercise, it's not my favourite thing. Um, but I think it's really important to bear in mind that we can, uh, you know, the, 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 the things that we do in our daily life do impact not just on our body, not just on our heart, but it does impact on our brain. And so I'd like to, for that, I'd just like to um, thank all the supporters that we have um, for stroke research here at, QB, research at QBI. We've had quite a lot of um, philanthropic support in the last couple of years, um, which I'm really proud of. So um, I'd just like to support, uh, thank those supporters. And I'd like to remind everyone that QBI is uh, on all forms of social media. So if you want to get in contact with us, feel free. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And so thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, you want me to go? Thank you, Lavinia. That was a fantastic presentation and really fascinating. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions from the crowd. So uh, you should all have your question slips. So if you've got your question, write it down there. And Dom and Leonie will be coming around to collect those now. Wave them in the air. Yes, fantastic. In the meantime, next month, next month we are of course back and our topic next month is sharing is daring, which, no, settle down, um, <laughs> is about the sharing economy and what that means for the future design of our city. So we'll have a number of guest speakers next week who will be, uh, next month rather I should say, who will be talking about different aspects of that and how it might solve some of the so-called wicked problems of city design. So it should be a really interesting session. Come along to that. Okay, we're starting to get some questions in, so I'm going to start asking these. Uh, I'm happy to take personal questions about the stroke too if anyone, you know, wants personal answers. That's great, because the first question <laughs> oh. is... <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
The first question is, did you have a scan of your brain recently and how are they compared to when you yeah. ha just had the stroke? Yeah, the, um, the, the scans that I showed you on, on, on the screen here, they were the most recent. They were several years ago now, but that was, say, uh, probably a decade after the stroke. So that's where my stroke ended up. Uh, the scans I had in the hospital straight after the stroke, the, the hole in my brain is actually a lot smaller um, because the, the brain cells actually go on to die for quite some time. So, uh, you know, it's a couple of weeks and they're still dying. So when I had my scan was only two days after the stroke, I think. So um, the lesion got bigger over time uh, and it's pretty much solidified where it is now. Uh, it's lined with some scar tissue which shows up on a different form of uh, imaging. But, yeah, that's basically the most recent form. We have several questions um, about exercise yeah. and what it means to the brain. Um, so a couple of questions are about what type, type of exercise yeah. is and best. And that's the bit... Uh, you see, the thing is, if I, if I talk about that too much, then I'm um, probably potentially causing problems for the study that they're doing at the moment. So I will say it's voluntary exercise, um, and there's a lot of research in animal models to show that involuntary exercise is actually bad for neurogenesis. So it's one of the things, it's a stressor, it causes a reduction in the production of new neurons. In animals, it's all voluntary and it is running. I'm not saying that's what we're doing, um, because we're using older people between the ages of 65 and 85, and many people at that age aren't actually running. Um, but we are looking at different time periods and different uh, intensities. Uh, of exercise, but I can't tell you the results of that because that study's ongoing. Sorry. So watch this space. Yeah, watch this space. And maybe there'll be a follow-up talk in 12 or 18 months. Perry can do that one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, sorry, there was one more question oh, about exercise, which is, do we know why exercise stimulates neurogenesis? Well, the act of exercising has a lot of, uh, releases a lot of different neurotransmitters in the, in the brain, uh, also particular hormones, um, and basically those are the, it's the neurotransmitters and the hormones that we're looking at because we believe it's a chemical trigger that is causing uh, the increased neurogenesis. I don't think there's a change necessarily in blood flow to the hippocampus, uh, but Really, that's a lot of the work that's going on in the animal models, um, is trying to understand the, the actual, the molecular pathway that that follows. Did I answer the question? Was that the Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, you know, given the complexity. Um, now, I know we've talked about maybe not talking too much about medical mm. side of things, because you're not that sort of doctor. I'm not that sort of doctor. <laughs> um, but... Uh, perhaps this one is which, the stroke signs that you mentioned at the start. Yep. Do they get worse over time or appear suddenly? Uh, they tend to appear suddenly. It's in, that's why I was talking about a sudden onset. Um, if, it, if you're talking about it appearing over um, hours uh, or a day, then yes, definitely that could be a sign of stroke. They do tend to be sudden. You know, they're catastrophic. Um, there are other things that might be contributing to the evolution of that. It might be that the, the, the other blood vessels are becoming blocked over time or that the, the ble if you have an aneurysm, the bleeding is spreading further and further. So it can progress. Um, and it, can, it, it could start off with one, one sort of slight deficit, so you might just have a slightly weak arm, and then it might progress over several hours to a fully blown paralysis. Uh, but any sudden onset uh, of damage, if, as soon as you're aware of it, I go straight to the hospital. I mean, the treatments that they can give uh, in terms of stroke, you're very, very limited at the moment. And that's basically a clot-busting drug called TPA, and that can only safely be given with it in the first three hours, perhaps four and a half. You know, they're trying to extend that out all the time. But time is critical, and if you get there outside that time, so if you wake up having had a stroke and they don't know when during the night you had your stroke, they can't actually treat you with that drug because it ha runs a risk of then converting to a hemorrhagic stroke where you end up with a bleed, which is much more catastrophic. Uh, so um, any sudden onset uh, of symptoms, anything neurological, go to the doctor. I mean, go, don't go to the doctor, go to the hospital. Uh, you know, that's what they're there for. It's an emergency. Stroke is an emergency. Right. You can have TIA, sorry, I'm just going to keep going now, that resolve. So it's like a mini stroke that is a temporary um, blockage in the artery and it might clear itself and then the deficits that you're experiencing might disappear. Uh, so TIAs or trans ischemic attack on, attacks only last for a couple of hours or those deficits, but they're actually an indicator that you might be at higher risk for having a stroke. So you should also seek medical help for those. Uh, TIAs are also a medical emergency.
Great. Um, question here, how long does it take for a human cell, sorry, a human neuron to grow? Oh, okay. Um, gosh, in a human, I, I can't tell you so much. I can tell you in a mouse that they, that they uh, you know, they divide. The division takes a couple of hours and then they're, they're those immature, once they decide to become neurons and they start showing that uh, double caught and positive, uh, you know, they're double caught and positive, they stay that way for a couple of weeks, two to three weeks, and then they turn into mature neurons, which is when they stop expressing double caught and they start expressing new N, which is another neuronal marker. And their morphology changes and their excitability changes, and that's how we know it's a mature neuron. Uh, so a couple of weeks in a mouse, probably similar in a human. We have double caught and positive cells as well, so... Um, question from, actually I'll go for it to Twitter first, from David who asks, what parts of the brain are involved in post-stroke fatigue? Oh, that's, see, post-stroke fatigue is really common. I didn't talk about that. It's a really common uh, effect uh, of stroke. Uh, and it doesn't matter what sort of stroke you have. A lot of people will end up with post-stroke fatigue. What exactly that is being caused by, I'm not sure. I think the jury's actually still out on that. I mean, I've got ideas. So for me to, for me personally, if I'm trying to navigate somewhere, if I'm trying to, just say I'm looking at a graph. If we just think about now, if I'm looking at a graph now, for me to interpret a graph, I can't just look at it and know what it means instantaneously, which is what I could do before I had a stroke. Now I have to look at each axis and look at what does each axis stand for. I have to look at this, the curve, look at the slope of the curve and where it intersects and really go very methodically through what that graph means. And so that takes a lot of brain power and a lot of effort because I'm using different parts of my brain to interpret that graph. So for me, I think that would contribute to any fatigue that I might feel. Um, fatigue for other people, it's very hard to say. Uh, Post-stroke depression is also really common. Uh, you know, it's a common side effect of stroke. Uh, because your life has changed overnight. But also, there's lots of things happening in your brain. You know, when you've got an area of cell death, you've got those support cells migrating in from all over the brain coming in to help try and uh, mop up all that damage. So there's, there's a lot happening in your brain that is not usually happening, you, you know, that inflammatory response. So, you know, these things have to be contributing to how our brain is functioning and emotions and controlling your emotions and depression and fatigue are all part of that um, higher order functioning in the brain. Perhaps following on from that, we have a question. Have you noticed increased capacity for new memories since your voluntary exercise? <laughs> yeah, I, I've got to say, I mean, but I've improved over the last 17 years. Um, I can't say that I can attribute it directly to exercise, but I can attribute it to my going back to university and exercising my brain in a different way. Uh, you know, I think if I'd done what was initially suggested to me, which was go home and watch daytime television, I never would have recovered, you know. The, I mean, well, I probably would have gone backwards. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's true. And, I, and th that's why, despite the fact that Perry and I like to headbutt over a lot of things, really, if he hadn't taken a chance on me and taken me into the lab and given me the space, a safe environment to get better, I would not have gotten better, I have no doubt. Some of that is confidence, but a lot of it is just continually trying to improve. And, you know, we're often told as stroke survivors that you'll improve, you know, your recovery will go on for only, you know, a year or two, you'll, you'll plateau and then that will be it, that will be the extent of your recovery. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of people and for a lot of functions, but I can only speak from my own personal experience and that is I'm still actually recovering, you know, it's been 17 years and I'm still recovering. Um, just before my daughter went overseas um, last Christmas, we were driving along in the car and she said, you know, Mum, you're better at navigating now than you used to be. Uh, and it was a significant enough change in my attitude and my ability to navigate that she noticed it without me asking her. I didn't prompt her for that. I didn't say, am I doing better? She realised just by being close to me that I was actually improving. So I think, yes, I know the plateau is, is talked about a lot and it probably does exist for a lot of people, but it, it's not for every function and it's not for everybody. So instead of being part of a group, you know, we're all just statistics, really. Be an outlier, you know, be one of the people who does keep getting better. It doesn't, you know, for some people, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you won't get better. I'm not saying it's all a bit of an effort thing, but unless you at attempt to get better, you won't, yeah. Look, I think that is a fantastic note to finish on. Could you please put your hands together and thank our fantastic speaker tonight, Dr Lavinia Codd. Thank you.
and join us for some food and drink now and back for Bridge Science next month. See you all soon. <laughs>